Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those who may be joining us from across the world. Thank you very much to everybody for attending today's session. Um, my name is Matt Jackson. I'm the current chair of the consultancy group. And beha on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome you all to the session today, as well as thanking Ian, um, who, who is going to be uh, presenting to our, our, our members today. There will be an option for questions and answers th uh, throughout the, at the end of the session. So please, if you have got any questions for Ian at the end of the session, please use that Q&A function that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen today. There is also a live transcript option at the bottom of the screen. So please, if, you have, if you're hard of hearing and you would like to see it display as, a, as, as subtitles, then use, use this uh, feature that we have available to us. The session is also being recorded. It will be made available to our members, placed onto the IOSH website, sent out to those who've attended today, and also for those individuals who may not have been able to attend the session today um, to, to watch at a later date. So I'd like to do a quick introduction to Ian. Um, first of all, thank you, Ian, for, attending, for, for delivering this session today. So Ian is the Managing Director of Vita Safety. He has over 15 years experience as a consultant and today's session is designed for both those who are either considering a move into consultancy or even the more seasoned professionals that we may have amongst us uh, within, within our membership. Ian is going to share some of the key lessons that he's learned as being a, from being a consultant over the many years that, he's, that he has managed his own business and some practical tips on how to market your business yourself and manage commercial and liability risk as well as, uh, uh, as, uh, as some information on contracts and avoiding bad debt. So thank you very much, Ian. I'll now hand over to yourself um, and good luck with the session. And thank you everybody for joining. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matt. Obviously, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, as Matt said, I'm gonna sort of cover off uh, some, of, I guess some of the key lessons that I've learned over a number of years, but the, obviously the session doesn't cover everything. So what I would say is please do feel free to, to contact me after today if you've got any specific questions but there will be time at the end of the session for any questions that people may may have because i'm sure there's going to be some areas that, that we haven't covered um i'm aware obviously we've got an international um group so you know there's some nuances and some specifics related to your country as well that might slightly differ from the, where i'm based in in the uk um so yeah so matt obviously mentioned i'm in hutchings i'd like, I'd like to think of this as my pre-COVID photograph. Um, so I think one of the things, you, yeah, obviously now I've got a beard, hair's a bit grayer. So obviously things have changed a bit over the last 18 months, but I think this, that was probably a couple of years ago now. Um, but I've, yeah, I've operated Vita Safety now for, well, I think it's about 15 years now. It seems like quite a long time. So just, I guess, just a little bit more background about myself. Um, a bit like Matt, actually, I was talking to Matt earlier before the session and we, we both, I think like a number of people that end up in in a health and safety role um, started out in, in a sort of military, um, which is a bit odd thinking about because I used to be an armourer. So I guess my, my role was ensuring that weapons worked effectively and that type of thing. So it's obviously a bit different to what I do what I do now. Um, so yeah, my I guess my background was quite varied, and I think one of the interesting points about that is is I do believe that can be quite helpful in consultancy because I think sometimes the more experience you have in different sectors, unless you're working in one particular niche, niche sector and, and one particular area, that, that can be quite useful. So yeah, my background was, was generally started out in engineering, um, sort of manufacturing. I went into what was called rail track at the time, which is now network rail. So working as a safety engineer. And then from there, I moved into, um, I guess, large scale consultancy businesses. So I worked for what's called DNV, which is now DNVGL, I believe, which is Det Norske Veritas. So they're, a, I guess, a Norwegian led risk management consultancy and um, certification business, which you might have heard of. I then went to work for DuPont uh, Safety Resources. I think the thing that obviously attracted me there was, you know, at the time, I think DuPont had a, a particular global reputation for safety. And so I was really keen to learn from that. And I established fighter safety in 2006. And I think, I think looking back, I think one of the main reasons I, I, I sort of set out on my, my own business was really that I'd, I'd learned quite a lot in, 
I guess, in, in industry and in these big consultancy organisations. But I felt there was something missing. And I think my, my thoughts at the time were that I wanted to move into something whereby I could define my own solutions for clients. So it wasn't necessarily a, a sort of scripted solution. It was more about, you know, finding this sweet spot where you can assist clients specifically with their their type of their types of issues. Okay, so that, I guess that's just a bit a bit about my background. Um, a couple of key things I'll run through, as, as as Matt said, I'm going to talk through a few sort of lessons I've learned over the years, and I think some things, I think particularly for those of you that may be starting out, that I think I, I've learned over time that I wish I'd done, you know, I wish I'd done first. You know, things I've learned over the years that are really important to get right. But I think even if you work in a bigger organization or you're planning to, you know, set up your own business or go and do your own thing as a, as a freelance consultant, that are just important to, to get right and are really, really critical in terms of probably protecting yourself as well and protecting your, you know, your other things in your life that are important to you. So I guess the big question is why, you know, why, and I'm still not clear why I sort of got into it, what some of the reasons were. I think some of it was probably financial. Some of it was probably wanting to control my own destiny. Um, but what I, you know, I would say if you are starting out, it's, it's actually, you know, the, the majority of health and safety consultancy, certainly in the UK, are generally either individuals or small businesses. So, I would certainly think if you're going to try and get into this um, this area or you're new to it, just sort of try and think about what's the actual outcome, what do I, why do I want to do this, um, and, and maybe I'll touch upon that a little bit later. But I think it's important. You know, I'm certainly not um, living in the south of France or anything. You know, I, I could probably earn the same that I do now in a senior sort of health and safety role. Um, but there are elements of things like you know you having a bit more freedom being able to sort of control your own time and, and all that sort of stuff. But so I'd really just try and think about what does that look like in the future? I think something I've certainly learned over the last few years is, um, you know, you set out to achieve something and if you're not careful, you carry on doing what you've always done, expecting a different result and, and things plateau. So it is very important to try and just to, to consider, you know, why am I going to do this and what's the impact on me? And I think, pretend, you know, even if you look at the financial side of things, is you know how much money do I need to earn um, to, to you know to get to to keep the lifestyle that I'm used to or to to increase that sort of thing. So just a couple of um, just a couple of points really in terms of starting out, and I think even though it says starting out on this on this slide, I think these are all things that we should think about regardless of where we are in our career and who we work for if you're self-employed or if you work for a bigger consultancy practice or you're considering becoming a consultant i think what i would say is building and maintaining a network and relationships is absolutely fundamental to consultancy and um, it was only actually earlier that i realized how many members there are in the, the irish consultancy group i think Matt said there was, I think, something like over 10,000 or uh, members. And I, I just didn't realize the scale, A, of the number of people that are working in consultancy, but the actual number of people in IOSH. And there's probably a lot more there we can do to build those those relationships. And I think just to give you a a very a few examples of why that's that's important, I think one is is marketing. So if you're going to set out on your own or if you work in consultancy, you know, something you do need to consider is you need to be able to sell yourself and sell your business and also market what you do and demonstrate the difference between what you do and what other people do, because there are a lot of consultants out there and there's a lot of businesses doing similar things. We recently did a, a piece of work for a client earlier this year, and the, the lead for that work actually came from somebody that I used to work with in 1998 which is scary because I think that was the year after I left the army. But the, the, the point with that is really that, you know, that's because I've kept up relationships. I've kept up networks over that period of time and people sort of still know that you're around. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just a really critical part of it. I think something else that you should, should really think about is what do I actually enjoy doing? Because certainly if you're going to set out in consultancy or you're going to work in this, this sort of space is, 
one, I think one of the benefits of, of, of working in consultancy is you can sort of start to shape what you do around the things that you enjoy doing. So there's no, you know, there's, I guess there's little point in trying to set out and do stuff that you don't actually enjoy. Um, so, you know, what do I enjoy doing? Um, why you and why me? And what that means is almost around, I think one of the things I found when I worked in large consultancies, and I think particularly with, with DMV and DuPont, was actually people weren't buying Ian Hutchings, they were buying the brand. So when people wanted to work with, with DuPont Safety Resources, it was almost a given that, you know, they weren't necessarily looking at who was going to deliver the work, but they were bright, they were buying into that brand. And that was that was the key thing for them. I think the biggest thing I noticed was when I <clears throat> when I set out on my own was was actually I had to start selling myself. And no one had heard of Vita Safety. And and I, I would imagine lots of people still haven't in terms of, you know, in industry. So really having to think about why am I different? How can I sell myself? And and if you are setting out on your own, you, you know, you do need to be able to sell yourself. You do need to be able to market yourself. People won't come to you. Um, it's quite a crowded space. So that's really critical. Obviously, social media is a massive thing that probably wasn't quite as big when I set out. I think we had the web. So we started out with a website. Um, you know, I think social media was probably just sort of getting a bit more popular in the mid the mid sort of 2000s but certainly i would say that it's absolutely critical to have a decent web presence and and some of these things you do what i would say sometimes it's worth spending a, a bit more money and money on some of these things up front to get them right things like it support having a decent website um finance you know i, I think i'd when i started the business obviously i went from having a relatively decent job company car pension share scheme all those sorts of things and then and a, and a very young family and you know jumping into thinking right well i've got to earn x amount per month and it, it, in some ways i i think that actually drives you because you have to get out there and do it you've got nothing else to fall back on i think even if you borrow i think if you do have to borrow money to start up which i did um and also lent you know borrowed some money from from somebody else is is actually being really cautious how you spend that money i think at the start i was probably a little bit too frivolous with, with, with some of those things so it, it's really key to and, and another thing i maybe talk about a little, a little bit later is the technical elements of being a health and safety consultancy unless you're going to get fed work by somebody else is only it's only probably 20 percent of what you do now, the other key competencies are things like marketing, sales, finance, um, writing effective documentation, you know, budgeting, all these types of things are absolutely critical. So it's really key. And something else you might want to think about was I, um, for quite some time, was a member of the Institute of Consultancy, which is linked to the um, Charter Management Institute. So some of those organizations outside of IOSH are really worth considering because you, you get to mix with other people that work in consultancy and management consultants, but they don't actually work work in the health and safety field. So you start to understand those those some of those communication skills, project management skills, and some of the things the other things that are essential to being a, a, a successful consultant. So something else to think, I guess, obviously to consider. If you're setting out or if you're considering going in you know setting your own business up is what sort of operating model should i have as a business i know when i when i set um vita safety up the, i guess a couple of things i tried to do was one was i tried to set up a website that made us bigger than we looked because essentially it was me um i immediately set up as a limited company and i immediately registered for vat even though we didn't have to so I think the the benefit of doing that for, for for myself at the time was we almost set up a or I set up a sort of a structure to grow into. So rather than having to worry about some of those things further down the line, it was having those things set up already. So I guess there's there's, there's pros and cons of different ways of working. So I think, for example, if you if you just want to be self-employed, you want to work for other people as an associate. You don't really want to do, be doing loads of marketing yourself, loads of sales. Um, 
that's actually a, that's quite a good way of working, providing you can get the work from other consultancies and other contacts. And I, you know, we we still use quite a lot of associate consultants, freelancers to fill either fill gaps in resourcing or when we need some specialism. So things like, you know, noise surveys, halves, occupational hygiene, fire, as I'm sure you're all aware, is is one of the, probably the most growing areas building safety in terms of consultancy at the moment. They're really interesting niches to get into. And something I would say is, you know, probably fire, fire risk management, fire risk assessment is the biggest growing area. If you, if you can um, consider some of those things in how you operate, that's, that's really critical. So the other thing I guess to consider is, you know, do I just want to work for myself or do I want to form a limited company and do I want to employ other people? And something, um, yeah, someone I know is very experienced um, in business. I think the point I put at the bottom there was one of the things he always said to me was, you know, once you start to take people on, you've got to be prepared to let them go. And it's it's quite a um, a responsibility to take other people on and employ people. So, and also they're different skill sets. So just because you want to grow a business, I think something I, you know, it's le I'm still learning really in terms of managing people. And, and managing colleagues that I work with is, you, you know, you need you might need some other training, you might need some other development in terms of managing people. It's not just just naturally because you're good at something. It doesn't mean you're good at, you know, managing people or managing a business as well. The the, the two separate things really. And the thing to bear in mind as well, if you're a if you do form a limited company, if you're if you're a director, you take on the uh, responsibilities and accountabilities as a director and health and safety is only a small part of that so there's lots of things you need to consider in terms of your own liability there's obviously different risks and opportunities with these different models so obviously you know if you're self-employed sometimes if you're an associate you can become a bit too reliant on a particular client or a particular consultancy to give you work and sometimes if you've got if people have people employed the priority will be to, to feed the people who are employed with work and make sure that there's enough work being delivered in house. So if you're working as, as, as an associate, sometimes you can become a bit too, too reliant. And I think that's the same with clients. So something obviously to bear in mind is in the ideal world, you, you know, you're not going to have more than 20% of your revenue coming from one, from one client. Cause obviously if you lose that, there's, there's issues. Um, <clears throat> Consideration of things like loss of income, you know, have you got adequate insurance for loss of income? How long can you continue without working? You know, however well you manage a consultancy business or manage your own time, it can be a bit feast and famine. So sometimes you've got to make hay while the sun shines, but other times there might be gaps in work. So it's really important to think about some of these things and, and probably just, you know, to, to, to capture these in some sort of business plan as well. So avoid it. Yeah, as I said, avoiding feast and famine. So the, the, one of the I guess one of the best principles I could probably share is you should always be marketing and, and developing business and, and, and your network. The best time to do marketing is when you're busy. What you don't want to do is get into a situation where things are getting a bit quiet. There's, you know, there's not as much work on the horizon as you'd like. And then you start marketing and trying to get more work and in desperation to try and get those things sorted. So it's really important. One of the skills I would suggest you you look into if it's something you're not you're not au fait with is man management of sales funnels and um, customer relationship management systems. So these are effectively just having a process in place that monitors different stages of, of marketing and sales and I guess for those of you that are a bit less familiar with the difference between marketing and sales is the way I always envisage marketing is marketing is essentially how you get somebody into your shop. So it might be a website, it might be social media, it might be targeted marketing campaigns. And once somebody's shown an interest in what you do, then that moves into a sales process. Um, so the sales process then is, they're two slightly, well, they're two quite different skills, really. Marketing is a different discipline to sales, in, in my opinion. Cash flow, I think anyone you speak to that's that's managed any sort of business will say cash is king. It sort of doesn't matter sometimes what you're doing elsewhere in a business, but if you run out of money, 
it's obviously going to have a really serious effect on you. So what I would just say on that point is um, and something I think I learned was <clears throat> if you need to borrow money or if you're looking at things like overdrafts is um, if you need to borrow money, borrow money, uh, you know, borrow more than you need if you can. And, and I think an example of this was obviously through COVID was where we had the um, some of the business interruption loan schemes from the government. And I think most business, as soon as it went to be underwritten by the, the government, and this is obviously what happened in the UK. I'm not sure what models happened outside of the UK, but most people I know in business borrowed as much as they could because it's low interest and you don't necessarily know what's on the other side of it. And if you don't need to use the money, that's fine. It's in your bank account. You can just pay it straight back. Um, I guess another key point as well is just thinking about what you're good at. If you're really good at being a health and safety consultant and you can earn X amount of money per hour, why, you know, why give that time up and start working on your accounts or working on admin or working on marketing? I'd, I'd really suggest getting a decent accountant and help with things like bookkeeping. There's some brilliant software out there now. We use something called Xero which is probably the, one of the most well-known software systems. Um, there's obviously lots of other systems out there that are really good, but I'd certainly recommend using some of those systems because, you know, years ago we were using spreadsheets and all sorts of stuff, and it was a bit of a nightmare, to be honest with you. But, yeah, really focus on what you're good at, where you can earn money, and see who are the best organisations, the best people to support that. So I put finance, admin, and marketing Another area which I'll touch, up, touch upon shortly, which is really critical, will be legal advice. You know, legal advice is, is usually worth paying for um, because it, it's going to save you a lot of a lot of issues in the future. There's some brilliant advice out there as well in terms of just you know business growth, managing a business. The Institute of Directors are brilliant. The business growth hub there's obviously the Irish consultancy group different sector groups federation of small businesses and and just outside of the uk you know i can pretty much guarantee there's going to be networking events there's lots of people out there you, you it's really worth i think not just because of you, you know not just trying to sell the business but i think developing some of those relationships so some of the relationships i've had with people that have helped me with my business since i started the business in 2006 and we still support each other now. So I think the key thing with networking is one is I wouldn't I wouldn't use it as a it's not a, it's not a mechanism to just try and sell what you do. I look at it as a mechanism to um, make good contacts who can support you in your business. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be referring work to each other. Um, but however, that that's a, that's obviously an effective way to look at who who were you know in terms of health and safety. Obviously, there's natural allegiances with HR consultancies, you know, um, employment lawyers, people like that, people that sell software. So building up some of these connections and these networks is really useful. Just a few, I guess, a few things to, to to mention that I think are really critical. And when I when I first started. Uh, my business, I used to, if, and I'm sort of probably a bit embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I mean, things like terms and conditions, contracts, and I used to just download stuff off the internet and use that. I would recommend not doing that. I'd, I'd recommend finding a decent commercial contract lawyer or solicitor to ensure that you've got robust terms and conditions for your business. It, I can't um, reiterate how important that is. So, first of all, it's making sure you've got decent terms and conditions in place. Obviously, things like insurance. So making sure you've got the adequate level to, levels of professional indemnity insurance. And the two, I guess the two key things in terms of contracts that I would recommend, well, two things. One is liability. So it's ensuring that your contracts that you have in place. And bearing in mind, if you employ associate consultants as well as, as you know, your terms and conditions with your clients, those terms and conditions need to be able to limit your liability. Uh, so it's either limiting it to the amount of the, the value of the contract or having a set limit, which is the cap for your professional indemnity insurance. Um, these things are, are extremely critical. I mean, the other thing is obviously payment terms. You know, when do you expect to get paid? Um, you know, and also what do you do if you don't get paid? 
you know, there are organisations and, and, you know, I, I would usually, we've got part of my, um, some of my legal advisors that can debt, re debt recovery as well. So that's absolutely critical. Um, so you've got to get that right. Make sure the insurance is adequate. Make sure your insurance is at the right level. You know, um, there's no point having, I don't know, as an example, 100 grand's worth of pro professional indemnity because a lot of those cases are going to be significantly higher than that. So it needs to be, you know, as high as you can afford to a degree. Um, how do you know if someone's going to pay? I mean, there's obviously quite a lot of stuff online that you can look at. I've, I've, I've got access to some, I think it's called Credit Safe. So it's actually a software system where you can look at organizations, you can see if they've got any um, judgments against them, what the financial performance is like. So you need to be able to understand their ability to pay and something we'll try and do with, with new clients. I think especially smaller businesses is just see if they're able to pay some money up front. So it might be 20% of, of the value of the contract. Um, but sometimes even just having that conversation might give you an indication of their willingness to pay because there are unfortunately there are clients out there that will you know they'll allow you to do work and they just they've got no intention of paying at the end of it so it's you know I don't it's happened and you know it's happened to us in the past we've had to write money off because of this so it's really critical to understand those sorts of things um I think, as I mentioned earlier, so obviously the legal entity of the business, how those sorts of things work. Something I'm just going to touch on, and it's not on the slide, was around writing of proposals. So in, as well as your terms and conditions for the work that you do, what's really significant, what's really important is having a clear scope of work. This should be in writing. And also something I've, I guess, probably learned over the years as well is sometimes what you need to do is as well as saying what you are going to do and the cost of that is also saying what you're not going to do. So something I've uh, learned through sort of various legal situations is sometimes it's, it's critical to say in a proposal, this does mean we're not going to do this. You know, so for example, we, we, we've been involved in a, we're involved in a cost project at the moment, which is, I guess, slightly high level. We're not doing cost assessments. But I've been explicit within the proposal or the contract to say, effectively, we are not doing the cost assessments for you. This is what we're doing. And you need to be extremely clear. Um, and I think just, just be minded if you write a proposal and you do a piece of work, if, however, your, however good your relationship is with that client or the people that you're working with, just think about what would happen if something went wrong. My, my personal personal view is I'm I'm less I'm slightly less worried about um insurance and liability because that's why we have insurance the thing that worries me the most is actually regulators so thinking about you know the HSC's approach to things in in the UK or the regulators in the country that you work in and you know how are we going to defend ourselves if this were to be scrutinized or legally scrutinized the work that we do Just to think, I guess, a couple of points about future proof in your business. I think websites, something I, and it's something I've only probably got to grips with in, in recent years is who owns the domain name for your website? We registered, you know, I registered ours years and years ago now, and it was only a few years ago that I was trying to understand, do I actually own this domain name? Where does it sit? And it actually took me quite a lot. There's lots of companies out there that will manage your website and the domain and stuff but you might you actually might not own that and it could sit somewhere else it could sit with you know a lot of the domains are sort of almost like subcontracted to different domain providers so i'd certainly think about asking the question of where does this ownership sit with the website you may want to think about protection of your brand and um, so within the last few years i went through we, we were we were sort of protected to a degree but i went through a process of um yeah, obviously, you know, having a registered trademark and a protected trademark and that type of thing. Technology, really critical to, to get on top of that, investing in technology as much as you can. You, you know, we've got some brilliant tools now, things like Teams, Office 365, all these things that our clients are using. We need to be able to work with them on those things. Something I haven't mentioned here, which is really critical as well, is, is, is IT security. 
we've had a, a few cases in the past where we've had a like an email phishing attack or something like that and it's caused absolutely can cause absolute havoc as you'd imagine so really understanding how secure those things are i think something you need to consider if you haven't done already as well as how, how do you um how do you keep copies of you know what we do we're providing advice that can end up in a you know as i said earlier it can be you know it can be legally examined at some point how do I save that advice and that information? Something I've put in place in the business is we have um, we have email archiving, and I, you can usually ask your your email provider or um, an IT advisor about how to set that up. So effectively, you know, if you're giving advice in emails or something happens and you're looking at back at advice that was given, you know, three or four years ago, there's a system where you can search some of that information out and you can find out, you know, what advice was given, but I'd certainly keep copies of those things as well and just make sure everything's backed up. Finance for non-financial directors is, there's a course for the IOD, which is probably a bit heavy for some people. It might be a bit long-winded, but it's certainly worth, worth, worth learning about. If, you, if you're gonna actually run a business or even if you're just responsible for profit and liability, is to understand, you know, how to read a balance sheet, what does PL mean, all these things that are really critical. Budgeting, you know, I can't uh, I can't again reinforce how important it is to be able to understand how to set a budget. And there's, you know, for, for most of us, we, we didn't set out to be, you know, working in finance and that side of things. So there's, there's there's some great books out there, and I'd be happy to, sh to share some thoughts on those. But I would definitely say get advice, get some help. And some of those organisations I mentioned earlier, like the Federation of Small Businesses, the IOD, um, Business Growth Hub, lot, and there's a lot of stuff online. You can you can obviously learn yourself around those things as well. But I'd certainly get a decent, even selecting the right accountant. I think in terms of getting the right accountancy, you you will find I think as you develop. You might go through phases of using different people, but I just ask for recommendations through the people that you already know that are doing these sorts of things. So was it worth it? Well, I'm still here. Um, and that was me, if you forget when it was now. That was going up Hell in about three weeks ago, which is in the in the Lake District in the UK. We were lucky with the weather and I didn't fall off, so I'm still around. Um, but I think, you know, look, looking back and I guess looking forward as well, I think one of the key, the key benefits I've found to what I've done is is there is a lot of stress and there's a lot of pressure with doing it. Um, but I think the benefits still outweigh those things. You know, it does give you a bit more flexibility. You're in control of your own your own time. And, you know, there's 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 lots of things you can do. I think the the, the, the key message with this as well is, and I've heard this for a number of people in the past is you've got to look after yourself um, because, yeah, particularly if you're reliant on your, you know, your family or friends or whoever, your loved ones are reliant on you. It's really key to just try and look after yourself. And I think certainly with, you know, the, what we've been through in the last 18 months or so and going forward um, that, you know, you need to think about your own mental health and well-being and, and looking after those things as well and looking out for each other. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I hope that's been useful. Um, my personal email, I, I can obviously send you. If you want to link in with me on LinkedIn, please feel free to do so. Or just drop any questions afterwards if there's anything. But I think there's probably a few, a few things in the Q&A. Um, I don't know if you want to share those, those Matt, at all. We'll just run through those. Yeah, sure, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, really informative session there. I'm sure a lot of people have taken a lot away from that. Um, so there are a couple of questions coming through. So I'll, I'll, I'll pose a couple that have come through. So, and this one's quite pertinent, particularly with the competence, um, the, the, the competence of consultants that has been put under the spotlight, particularly with Bremfeld. So one of the questions is, what qualifications should I aim to have and level of IOSH membership? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, when I employ consultants now, I would ask for a minimum of grad IOSH membership level uh, as a minimum. And I think uh, as well, I think I think in terms of competency, you need to think about it a bit more broadly, because I guess you could have someone that's not a grad IOSH member. Can I just check? You can still hear me, Matt? I can, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I've got the headphones said call ended for some reason. Um, 
So it's, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly say you look at min, minimum of grad IOS, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're competent to do certain things. So it's much broader than that. I think you've got to have some technical ability in certain areas. You might have had experience in certain areas. So I think the HS, if you look at, I guess, if you look at, I think most of the cases I've seen where there's been a prosecution of a consultant, I think particularly in health and safety related areas, it sometimes seems to me, Grenfell aside, that someone's missed something quite obvious, or they've not even read the HSE guidance. Um, and I think one of the examples I remember was something to do with um, quarry work in a quarry and the consultant hadn't given advice on silica dust, which is silica dust is a, is a, one of the most significant issues in that type of area. Um, so I've probably gone on a bit, but yeah, say grad IOS, but just don't think of that as the limiting factor. Thanks, Ian. Uh, the next question is, how did your business grow via word of mouth? Uh, any recommendation and recommendation sorry yeah I mean I, I was quite lucky in a way because of what I'd done before I'd sort of built up a bit of a network and I'd um, I one of my first I think my one of my first major clients actually worked in in, in the insurance sector had almost sort of said to me right they knew what I was doing well give us a shout because we'll have some work for you um, but I so I think you sort of have to build on that first. So I think it's very difficult to say, right, next Monday, I'm gonna start out as a consultant. I don't really have a network and then I'll just build it up. Cause that, it literally takes years, you know, to do that. So, um, I mean, certainly being prominent on things like LinkedIn, on Twitter, social media is brilliant now because obviously you can connect to lots of people, you can have conversations. And or, or just some of those some of those local groups, local networking groups and business groups. It's just getting out. They just need to get out there and talk to as many people as possible. I think. And also, you know, when you do a decent piece of work, is is ask clients to refer you. I think something we forget to do too often. I still forget to do now. Is just say, do you know anyone else that might need might need my help? Sort of do it that way. The other thing to do is partner with other businesses that that are. You know, maybe aligned with what you do, as I said earlier, HR, employment law, software, um, other professional service firms who have got some sort of allegiance to your type of work, but obviously they don't offer your services. So partnering and referral that way works well. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, we've been asked by, asked by Irish webinars if you can just drop your screen. The contact details have been shared in, in the chat function, uh, Ian. So if you just want to drop that and then. Yeah, sorry. Good shout. Um, and then the next question is, do you have a business, did you have a business model when you started your company? Um, and what advice would you give people in terms of putting together a, a business model? Yeah, I had a business plan, which was purely written to get a loan from the bank. That was it. And, and basically my business model was I'm going to get X amount a month and this is how much you need per month to survive. And that, the, I mean, the way, the, the issue with, and I don't know what it's like now, because I've not, luckily I've not had to go through that for a while, but it was sort of you had to write your business plan to get through the process with the bank and the bank would almost tell you what you needed to write. I, I don't think I had a proper business model as I understand what a business model is now. So I'd certainly, rec I'd, I'd certainly say look ahead five, ten years or whatever and think about how, and to be honest with you, I've only probably got it right in the last few years. You know, we, we plateaued for a while and it's only because I've got like some non-exec help and other people help, you know, something I wish I'd done a long time ago was almost got more external assistance from people that have grown businesses and you know moved on from there to understand because the other thing is well you can do what you like but it might not make any money so you've got to make a decision do you want to do this purely to make a lot of money in a way because there's loads of businesses and we all know them out there that just they don't offer a great service they, they do pilot high sell it cheap but the people who run those businesses are extremely wealthy. So you, the integrity might not be there, but you've got to sort of question yourself about that. But yeah, I'd definitely say think about the model, how it's going to work and do that as soon as you can. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Um, and then the next one is, is around proposals. So uh, we've been asked the question, um, a quote based on a day rate rather than for a piece of work in your experience, would you recommend quoting on the piece of work or on a day rate? What do you see more often when you are working with associates? 
for an asso well associates that work with us we we know what their standard day rate is and we 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 work our pricing out based on that i would avoid in terms of us doing a proposal for client i was trying to focus on fixed price for deliverables i avoid day rates as much as you can and i guess the two ways of pricing as well briefly one is what they call essentially cost plus so it's okay what do i need what's our basic costs and then what's the margin we want to make on top of it so that's what cost plus pricing and the other thing is just value based so if you're fortunate enough to be able to do probably work that's probably a little bit more strategic with with larger clients their their value isn't necessarily in the the price it's about the level of service and what the deliverable is going to be so you can think about you know, I can I can price this a lot higher, potentially. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd avoid talking about day rates as much as possible. That's what I was, because if you if you're working with clients and, and I think all they're worried worried about is what's your day rate. You, I understand that in certain sectors. So for example, if you're doing construction site inspections or you're doing some of that type of work, um, that's that's how stuff's priced. But generally, if you get if you if you're niggling about, oh can be charged 50 quid less a day or something like that. You, you, yeah, you want to try and avoid dealing with people like that, I think. Um, the next one is, do you have any views on portal or app-based customer file management forms, procedures, et cetera, for retained advisor customers? Yeah, I mean, we don't we don't really have a one ourselves. And I think it's a good idea. I know there's lots of companies out there that do it and they provide that. and And... Some of my other role I'm involved in is actually a trustee for a multi-academy trust, and I've got access to some similar systems to that. So I think I've got a view in that. I think they're really useful, um, and and it's some, probably something where we might look into for some of our schools clients. I think you've got a number of clients that are very similar. I mean, something I have done is tried to partner with software providers. So sometimes if it's something that you can't you, you, you can't do or it's too cost prohibitive, it's partnering with other peoples that do that, uh, other other companies that can do it. But yeah, I think they're a good idea. But I think the danger is is also not just letting people have a portal, but don't give them any customer service with it. Or give them two options, you know, this is you've got access to this, this is the price, but that that's sort of it. Or if you want the gold standard. This is the support around it because a lot. I think certainly a lot of smaller businesses, they 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 want help doing the stuff. The advice isn't enough for them. They actually want hands on. It's just the time to actually get on and do stuff. It's like me, um, getting help with marketing consultancy. I'd much rather pay someone to just do some of that stuff so it frees up my time. I know health and safety is different because it's a regulatory thing, but you know that's. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're, I think they're, they're a useful thing for, from a client's perspective. Um, someone's made a statement. Um, terms and conditions do not uh, do need to be clear. Do not scare clients off by not making it clear that you're offering a service they need. Tailor service to the client, not a one size fits all. Yes, totally agree. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's a balance there as well because. Um, Obviously, the more you tailor things, the more time it takes, the more the more costly it is, which is fine. Which is what you know the the bedrock of of my business is has always been quality and customer service, and people will pay a premium for that. You know, I can I can pay I know I can pay less for legal advice. I know I can pay less for marketing, but I pay a bit more because I want that service. So I think sometimes it's finding those clients that value that. And also have the integrity that that, sit, that sits around it. But also, there are business models where people will just do the same thing all the time. And from a business perspective, actually, that's almost like a franchise model. So if you look at the best, the people that are best in the world, like McDonald's and stuff, that's what their business is founded upon. So there's not necessarily anything wrong with it, as long as the client knows what they're getting. And I think that's the challenge with what we do. Is there are some there are some consultancy that, that will miss sell. You know, the client won't get what they're expecting and they'll get tied into a long-term contract. Um, someone said, what sort of marketing did you use at the start when money was tight? 
yeah, that was me just creating stuff myself, to be honest with you. I, I would even do my own testimonials and write stuff and get clients to fill things out, PDF it. Um, something to avoid, I think. One of the things I've made a few mistakes, and I think someone asked a bit about mistakes earlier on the chat that I saw pop up, was just random marketing. So just getting massive marketing lists and posting stuff to people. My experience is that generally doesn't work that sort of scattergun approach i think you're much better focusing on a you know okay let's focus on a particular sector and just go into that as much detail as you can and i think the best way is going to be word of mouth you know if, you, if you're limited for cash um it's actually just talk you know you can spend i don't know for example if you spent a thousand pounds on some a piece of marketing you could spend that in time just going to meet people, going to events, talking to the right people, just getting out there and just getting your name known. And, and I think within obviously the, the obviously within the, the consultancy group is there's a great opportunity for us to, to network as well. I, I would say is, you know, I, I didn't realize until this morning how many members there were, which is astounding, really. So, yeah, really, really helpful. No, it's certainly something that we're looking at as a committee and is, is getting a, um, you know, a network, more networking sessions in. And I think as well, you know, people probably don't use the IOSH forums enough as well. They're, they're a tool that we yeah. network and engage with people. And I know we had the conversation before the event started about, you know, if there's a particular area that you, you need as a sub consultant and want to work with somebody on then you know, those forums are available. But we, we are looking at it as a consultancy group of how we can better network as, mm. as um, and members. Um, the, another question is, did, did you cover all sectors at the start or did you st stick to one particular sector? It's probably coming back to the question around competence. Yeah, I think I would, well, if I thought I was competent to do it, I'd do anything at the start because I just needed to get money in, to be honest with you. That was that was the reality. I was lucky in a way that I'd... Um, had a good relationship with a particular insurer and pretty much at the start, I think probably one or two clients, most of my work was with them and it was something I'd already done before. Um, and in fact, I'd done a piece of work for an insurer, which was actually a safety culture evaluation. So because I'd done quite, quite a lot of this stuff in DuPont, a lot of the stuff I was working on at the start was more like safety culture and leadership evaluations and that type of thing. And they'd seen me do that, but they'd also seen other elements of what I'd done and said, well, actually, you could, be, you could be quite good at doing some surveys, some risk surveys for us. So I moved into that. But I, yeah, I think, yeah, you, you need to avoid doing stuff that you're not, you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think I've probably done stuff in the past. I might, you know, if I, if I reflect on it now, I probably shouldn't have done. And, it, and I, you know, I researched stuff and I tried to do a thorough job and I probably did do a thorough job based on what I'd researched. But I think re in reality, from a liability perspective, looking at it now, I probably shouldn't have done it. So I would certainly say it's really, yeah, you need to do what you do, what you know. I think if you already got a sector you work in, you know, people in that sector, you know that, you know, the type of work. Yeah, just just do that to start with anyway. Thanks, Ian. Um... There's another question. Not all consultants are the same. What can what what can we do be doing more of to educate businesses to choose their consultant wisely? Something, yeah. Um, it's difficult, this, isn't it? Because you get people, and this is where you get into fees, isn't it? It's like, well, we've had a quote from such and such, and I had one recently actually where we did a quote, and part of our quote was to do a fire risk assessment and to do some health and safety related work as well. And um, someone I know actually uh, uh, has asked for the quote and they, they they just came back and said, oh, they shared the other quote with me and they're, they're coming X percent lower. I said, all right, okay, well, can you just check what the qualifications are for the person that's doing the fire risk assessment? Because we would reckon, I said, whether you go with us or not, this is what we would suggest as a minimum. There, were, there was, I don't know if it's still around, but there used to be an IOSH consultancy guidance document um i think it was a, it was called like selecting a consultant or something like that this is years ago i don't even know it's still there but i used to share that with clients sometimes um but yeah i think the education pit you almost need to you, you're right you need to sort of educate them and say well 
you know, what level of qualifications they've got, what level of competency. This is, this is the difference, really, which I think is key. Okay, thanks, Ian. Uh, we'll take one more question uh, from the floor um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll look to wrap up. Um, so what is your approach to working with two clients who are competitors? I'm trying to think of if we've... Yeah, we, we do. Do we have many like that? Yeah, same sector stuff. Um, I mean, obviously, one's good for selling to the other because you've done work with someone else, so that's that's a bonus. Um, I think from an integrity perspective, you just have to have a wall between them and how you operate. You know, obviously, they wouldn't expect you to talk about the other client. Um, they might know that you're working together, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Personally, I think you can work with you can work with competitors. Um, they do quite often. What I find is they do try and find out what the other one's doing. Um, so you have to be careful about your language in terms of just not saying, "Well, this yeah, such and such is doing this and X, Y, and Z." But because uh, they often know each other as well, I often find obviously people know each other in the same set. So yeah, I, I don't think there's there's anything to worry about with that. I think you just need to be mindful of your professional integrity and your approach to it really okay. thanks ian there are some other questions and, and we'll endeavor to get back to you all on, on, on some of those questions that we haven't been able to answer um, but to finish on a high in um and i think sometimes we, we we can get a bit of negative press as consultants um but what, what's been your biggest success as a consultant um to date i'm crikey <laughs> um depends which way you look at it oh crikey i think what's been my one of my what i'd like to think of a big success is people that i've been i've employed i've helped them develop and they've gone on to greater greater things which at the time you think is a bit negative because quite often it's just clients poaching people so i feel like you're breeding ground you're basically a recruitment consultancy so you bring people and help them develop a bit and then they just go and work somewhere else. Um, but I think that's not the way to look at it. I think it's about that, that, that makes you feel proud if you see people have moved into more significant roles uh, in, the, in, the, in the profession. I think that's probably one of my greatest achievements, I would say. Well, it shows you're doing a good job if people are poaching your stuff. <laughs> I know, it's a nightmare. <laughs> you need to employ people no one wants. <laughs> <laughs> okay well thanks very much ian as i said really informative session there i'm sure everybody on the call has uh, has got a great deal from that and uh pers a personal thank you from uh, the iosh consultancy group committee thank you to to summarize um great session thank you very much uh thank you everybody for attending um as i said on my recent chairs letter we are we have got a number of events scheduled up until the end of the year uh, we reached out to you on the survey at the beginning of this year you spoke we listened um, and, we, and we've got a, a decent number of events uh, set up for, for the remainder of this year so thank you everybody for attending um, as i said there are some questions remaining we will endeavor to get back to you on those questions that we've been unable to answer due to time restraints uh, there's also a poll that's popped up um, if you could please just take a moment of your time to complete that um, and as we said before Ian's uh, presentation has been recorded it will be uploaded onto the IOSH website and sent out to the attendees or those who've registered for the webinar um, and we'll also have a committee mailer sent out with a link inclu included to that presentation so thank you very much Ian thank you everybody for joining and we hope you have a great day and a, a great weekend thank you cheers Matt <laughs>